Good evening, church. At least it'll be evening before you get this. It's a beautiful afternoon here, and uh, as you're watching this, it's at least yesterday, I'm sure. Um, but I hope that whatever time it is while you're watching this, it's great and that you're having a good and blessed day. Um, let's go ahead and get into our study tonight of Colossians. We're going to do Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 1, which is uh, Paul's household codes. Um, and this will pretty well finish up uh, the meat of the letter to the Colossians. There's a whole bunch of greetings at the end of this letter, almost as long as the greetings that you get in the book of Romans, which is a little surprising given the brevity of the letter. Um, we'll look at that next week, but uh, this really will finish up the main point of the argument. Um, Hope it's okay. I'm going to skip over the the review where we talk our way through the main thrust of the argument. If you want to get that, there's uh, three or four videos already up online, and you can go, go look at a previous one of those. But uh, we're going to jump right into um, looking at the household codes um, with the understanding that this uh, this really does follow right on top of what's been said. And it might seem like this is a different topic than what he's been covering, but in fact it isn't. Um, he's actually going to continue to stress kind of living out the Christian life um, as he has been for the previous 17 verses. So recall the argument of the previous 17 verses, I will cover that really quickly, is that you set your mind on things above and then you have this practice of the putting off of vice, the putting to, to death what is worldly in you, and the putting on of virtue, the things of Christ. You put those on while putting the other off. Um, and that seems to be like it's a different discussion than the discussion of how do you live in your family. Those seem to be two different topics. But in fact, they are not. And there's a few reasons why they are not. And particularly in the ancient world. This one is just generally true. If you're not a Christian in the way you behave in your family, you're probably not a Christian in the way you behave anywhere else. Um, if you can't follow Christ with the people that you're closest to and most naturally are inclined to love, and that's your family. You're, you have natural bonds that cause uh, it to be easier to love them. It also causes it to be much harder to love them because you get a lot closer to them. So you encounter both your sins and theirs, and you encounter both your weaknesses and theirs on a more regular basis because they're there. But if you're not behaving Christianly with those much more meaningful relationships in your life, then you're probably not going to be behaving in an authentically Christian way in the less meaningful relationships in your life either um, because you're you're just not um, there's a higher cost but also a higher benefit to behaving christianly in your home and if you're not willing to pay that cost you're probably not really willing to pay it out there either now of course the converse of what's on the on the screen there right now is is also true uh, if you are able to behave christianly at home it becomes far easier to behave Christianly in when you're in relationships with those who are uh, not in your immediate home, and also when you're uh, among those who are not Christians at all. Um, if you're treating fellow Christians and you're treating your family members Christianly, then you're far more likely to, to treat the outsider Christianly as well. Now, Paul, I think, would have had another very significant reason for behaving Christianly at home, and that's because living as a Christian in your family was very much a missional endeavor. Um, it's a way that the church grew, and that is because of the difference between uh, our family, what we think of as a family, and a family unit, a family structure, and what the ancient world would have thought of as a family structure. Um, living Christianly in your family um, in a family structure like ours, you have an influence on a few people. But living Christianly in a family in the ancient world, a very large group of people that you were interacting with. Let's, let's look at that really quickly. So, you know, this is a picture of your typical assumed uh, American family. You know, you've got a, a, two, a man and his wife. 
um, husband and wife and their 1.5 kids or 1.8 kids or 2.5 or whatever the average is. But that's what we think of as a family. So in our uh, world, a household is going to be the, the, a man and his wife um, and their children, you know, and that's going to be what's going to make up a family. So you might have a very, very large family of eight or eight or 12 people or something like that. If, if there's 12 people, then they've had 10 children, you know, um, and that's a huge family in the modern world. Generally, it's one or two kids now. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the concept of the, of the modern family. In the ancient world, things were very different. This is the, this is the layout of a, um, a Greco-Roman house. So um, on the left-hand side of the screen there, you've got what, well, I'll just go ahead and highlight it. You've got what would have been the, the public part of the house. Um, and so you'd have a little courtyard there, maybe with a fireplace. There might be the dining area there. Um, you might have a, a kitchen, a food preparation area there. And uh, some of those little rooms on either side, they might be shops. And so you might welcome people who are not part of the household into this this building and sell them stuff out of there. Um, so that would have been the what you would have thought of as the public area of the home. Um, then you uh, would own, there probably would also be a, a household shrine to um, the household gods that are in there, uh, along with something to... Uh, to make sacrifices on, um, that would have been part of the home. But all that would be kind of the public, the front part of the home. Now you'll notice that on the lower part of the screen, there's a hallway that leads you uh, into one big room and then um, also into this back area. And this back area would have been the, uh, the part that belonged to the family. Now, each of those little rooms that are off of the uh, off of the big room would have been um, sleeping chambers, so bedrooms. But when we say bedroom, we generally think of a room that's, that's you know got one or maybe two people in it. Um, maybe two brothers might share a room or something like that. No, what we would think of as a family unit, the husband and wife and their children, they would all occupy that room together for sleeping. Um, and if they had three or five kids, they might have a slightly larger room. If they've only got a couple kids or if they're barren, they might not have a very big room. Um, but that, that would have been what we think of as family units would have been living in there. Maybe, um, you know, the, the father and, and mother and their kids and maybe uh, her dad or her mother or something might also be in, in there. And so you've got, what is it, eight or nine of those rooms around the big courtyard. Um, and so you'd have nine of what we would think of as a family unit living in this one house. And in the center there, there's a very large courtyard. And that would have been kind of the communal private space where, you know, everybody uh, eats together and they, you know, spend time talking to one another. Um, they're obviously all kind of up in each, other, each other's business in this kind of living setting. Um, that big space there in the middle might, that might not have a roof on it at all. Those circles might be uh, pillars supporting a large roof and that might be a sunken area that goes down into the ground. Um, and so there might be a section of clear sky with that smaller roof over it. Um, and then you can step down and have lots of seating area there. That might be the private dining area. Um, and it might double as the dining area and also a gathering area. Um, and then, as I said, these, these smaller spaces, those are going to be your, your bedrooms. So, uh, like I said, the, the modern family is going to be that, that maybe four or six people. That's going to be your, you know, a six is pretty big, really, for what we think of as a family. For the ancient family, it looked much more like what we would think of as a family reunion, except all those people are going to be living together in that household structure. Um, I counted, I may have missed somebody, but I counted in this picture that you're looking at on the screen right now. Um, there are 72 people in that photograph, and that would have been what you would have thought of as a, as a family in the ancient world. Now, 
in that family, there would be one person who was kind of the head of the whole family, somebody who would be thought of as the potter familias. Here's an uh, illustration of the potter familias. Um, and what the potter familias does is he walks around with his hand out, and he's stretched out, just sticking out like that. No, that's not true. That's not true at all. No, the potter familias is the, the family father, potter being Latin for Fam, or for father and familius being of the family. So he's the father of the family. And he would have had a lot of roles in that family. He would have been pretty much the king of the household. He would have been, you know, the father knows best. Of all 72 of those people, what he said was would pretty well be law for all 72 of them. Um, he also would have been the, uh, the priest who was responsible in, in seeing to the spiritual well-being of the overall family. He'd have that kind of responsibility. Um, he'd be like the elder um, that you would go to. And living in the home with him might be his younger sibling, you know, a little brother, a little sister, something that he's taking care of. Um, his aged, decrepit father might be there too. Um, and they might form something like a uh, what we would think of as the village elders for the family, where the family would go to them to seek counsel and uh, wisdom and advice. So the, uh, the paterfamilias would be the guy who kind of reigns over that family and determines its course. Um, and everyone living there would be kind of under that one person's authority. Now, when we think of church, we generally think of church um, as, a, as a gathering of a, a kind of group structure that we don't know what to think of it as, but they would have in the ancient world. You know, we don't have families of 150 people, but they absolutely did. And so this church, when it used family names for each other, it wasn't being just weird. You know, they weren't just saying, hey, Brother Brown, you know, and, and I'm supposed to think of you as my brother, so I'm going to use that, but you're not really my brother. No, they would have thought of themselves as having moved from one large group that gave them their identity into another. And so the church becomes family of God. And you find yourself in that family. The Potter Familius is obviously the father, and and uh, Jesus, is, as his son, is going to be the one reigning over us. Um, he's going to be our priest to the father. And, um, you know, that this is going to be a family structure. And the people who enter into it are going to become, think they're going to begin to think of themselves as part of the family of God. But they still maintain their family relationship in that other structure where you've got 70 people. So, you know, what you might have is just like a couple of people in, in a church might be going into a family that is mostly not Christians. So those two people, those two dots that move over there, that they're connected by lines because it's, it's the same people, but they're part of two family structures. They're part of the family of God. Um, and it would be very much a household of faith. They would get together regularly. They would spend time together. Um, once they had access to um, uh, one of the other families' homes, they would begin meeting in that family house. Um, before that, they would, you know, before they have a house, um, because they've kind of taken over a family, they would begin in uh, meeting under a tree or something like that. They're going to be traveling you know, those people are going to see themselves as part of that family where they're the only two Christians and the other, you know, 60 or so people are not Christians. But then they go and they're really going to see themselves as really part of this other family. And that's going to be true also in, in various group, you know, amounts. Um, and as they are participating in their families, maybe you end up with a family that's entirely Christian. Once that happens, the church will gather at that house. And maybe that'll happen in several houses across the city. And so you'll get churches that meet in this person's house and in this person's house in the same city. They would have thought of themselves really as the same family, just meeting in, in different homes, living, if you will, in different homes. Now, how does this happen? Well, imagine you have a church of 20 people. And at this point, those 20 people, they all live um, they're all meeting together uh, down by the river. You know, that's, that's their meeting place. 
Um, and that church is made up of 20 people. And in our theoretical setting, we've got four families that they're drawing on. Now, of course, in the village, there'd be more than four families. But for sake of putting it all on a screen and making it understandable, let's say we've just got four families. And those families are made up. There's one household that's pretty small, which is 36 people, a pretty moderately sized, medium sized family of 60, and then a couple of big families of 85 and 120. And that family of 120 people is that big because it's a pretty powerful family and they own three houses. So those 120 families are housed maybe along one city block um, in three separate structures. They would have saw themselves all as belonging to the same family, but they own three. They own a city block instead of just one villa. Okay, so how do the 20 people who are in this church find themselves in those families when they go out to their family at home? Well, this is how that breaks out. So in that, that 36 uh, member family, fully a sixth of it is Christian. There are six people there. There are only four people in that family of 60, two in the family of 85, and then eight of them are in the family of 120. Now, I said earlier that being a Christian at home would have been thought of as a missional reality because this is not going to stay static. Things aren't going to stay in this breakdown. They're going to change over time as these Christians live Christianly and end up having influence in their family of origin. So over time, maybe you end up with uh, a change in those numbers. So we originally had, you know, just two people in in the family. Well, we've still got two and we've still got six in that other. But you see that there's been a big change in that family of 120. There are 22 people there now who are all converted to Christianity. And in fact, they make up one of the entire houses. That one house in that family has become Christian. Now, that would have been a big deal to that family. They definitely would have felt it. And they would have been probably taking some movements against what was going on in their family. You know, the, the non-Christians probably would have been beginning to, to throw up some sort of persecution or resistance to what was happening in their family. Notice across town there in that group of 60, it's gone down. There's only three people now because the pressure put on those on those four would have been immense. And, uh, and so maybe the, one of them just decides, you know what, this isn't worth the kind of pressure that I'm getting. But then maybe a week later, you know, that group of 22 has, has won three converts in the family across, not, not the next house over, but the next house over that. You know, that they've convinced three people over there and it's beginning to grow. And the, the family of, of 85 has now grown to five members in there but the big story obviously in this this slide is the uh, the family of 60 has suddenly all become christian all at once um they've gone from from four down to three but then all the way all the way up to 60 you know how would that happen well let's go back to our hypothetical family reunion photo and imagine that this is an ancient uh, gathering of Christians, um, that are not Christians, uh, an ancient pagan household where there are some Christians found in the household. And let's say that these uh, are the Christians, that you've got a, a, a brother and a sister represented by the lady in purple and the guy in the blue shirt with the white stripe across it. That That's a brother and sister, and um, they you know, they're there, but then also one family household unit, so a man and his wife and their two children, and there's your converted Christians as the whole thing begins. Now, just like in, in uh, any gathering of people this large, you're going to have relationships that are closer and relationships that are furthermore, some that are, that are more meaningful to you and some that are just more distant by nature. And some people probably that irritate each other, that they don't like each other. So let's say that the sphere of influence of these, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people kind of looks like this, that there, there's a large chunk of the family that is not being touched by their Christian influence at all. But there is a large group of people that are under their influence. And this is where they're likely to eventually, if they're living Christianly in front of them, they're going to get somebody's attention and someone is going to go, why are you so happy all the time? Or what is it about you that, you know, you guys have such a good marriage. What's going on? Because our marriage isn't as good as yours. 
So, and, then, and remember, these things are going to be very much on display. You don't go home across town at the end of the day. You go into a room at the end of the day. See, and you spend most of the day with each other. Okay? So, at the end of, you know, say several weeks, this family of people has managed to convert just one other person. But now, the sphere of influence looks more like this, and almost the entire family is being touched by Christian influence now. And let's say the brother and sister have, have had uh, conversations with just this one guy, and, and he becomes Christian. Well, now maybe the sphere of influence looks like this, where you've got an intensified area where they're all close, really close to the people in that, that, that kind of overlapping uh, set of circles. Now, let's say that the Potter Familius is the guy there who is outlined in yellow, that he is the head of the entire house, not just of one of the little rooms. You know, he's the husband who's in charge of that family unit. He's in charge of the family. He's going to be the family king, family priest. You know, basically, he's, he's your, your prophet. He is the family's guy, and he sets the course for the family. And remember, he was in this cone of influence of these three people. And so maybe you've only got three Christians really having influence on them in a family of 72 persons. But let's say that they managed to con convert that guy. Well, if that happens, then, then what's going to happen in the family is you're not going to have Christians, uh, Christian individuals anymore. You're going to end up with a Christian family because if the Potter Familius converts, he's going to tell the family, okay, folks, we're a Christian family now. And everyone in that family is going to say, okay, what do I got to do? Now, obviously, you're going to have differing levels of commitment. I mean, Christianity was never a mass conversion um, without mental assent kind of religion. So maybe that guy there in the blue shirt, you see the one I'm talking about, maybe that guy is not real sold on this whole Christianity thing. Um, he would still be living in a Christian family. He probably would be baptized as a Christian, but maybe he's never really bought it. But once you get the Potter Familius, the family goes through a conversion together where they all say, okay, we're Christians. And overwhelmingly, the majority of them are probably going to become actual Christians who devote themselves to learning about Christianity and trying to understand it and living as Christians together. At least that's true if the people who are leading the Potter Familiars to become Christian are actually genuinely Christian themselves. And that's why living as a Christian in your family would have been considered very much a missional endeavor and something that you did for missional purposes, because you might be one of two or three Christians in this group of 75 or 60 or 100, and that by living as a Christian there, you might convert two or three more who might then go on to spread the influence throughout the family and convert a large group of people, maybe even getting the, uh, the main person, the family chief, who then would help to convert the entire family to Christianity. So this, that's why this whole thing follows immediately after the putting off of vice and the putting on of virtue. That's why this is, it's so important that, that this comes immediately after this model of setting my mind on things above, receiving power from there to then put off vice and put on virtue. That by having my mind set up there, my mind is then empowered to fight this battle. Well, that is how I carry out my mission in my family. Because unlike someone that I just meet in the street and I do business with, my family has a lot of very intimate interaction with me. And if they see me living as a Christian, then I may begin to have influence for Christ with these people who are watching me. And if I don't live this way, by this model, putting off vice, putting on virtue, by setting my mind on things above, if that's not going on, then I'm not going to have a lot of Christian uh, influence. So 
I, the reason this immediately follows is because this thing is not just about me. It's about the family that I'm working in. Now, I want to point out that Paul's teachings are a mixture of culturally expected and culturally unexpected stuff. That what Paul says to the Christian family, some of it, the pagans would have thought, well, why do you need to tell us that? Um, I mean, of course, we're going to do that. Everybody does that. Um, and then there are things that the pagans would have heard and gone, what? <laughs> that's weird. You people are weirdos. That's what they... That's what they would have said. So the culturally expected things are always given Christian motives. And so even though it's what you would have done anyway, you do that thing now, not because um, you're, the world around you is telling you to, but because it's expected of you by Christ. And here's the Christian way to do this culturally expected thing so that that what might have been a cultural duty set upon you anyway becomes a way of living out your faith for Christ. The culturally unexpected things arise from Christian motives, and for the most part, those go unexpressed in Colossians. They are expressed in Ephesians, where we get a similar household code. You get uh, there, the uh, the emphasis is placed more upon the... Um, the unexpected thing. Husbands love your wives. And then he unpacks a ton of the Christian motive. Here, he just says, you know, do this. And I think that the, the Christian motive is mostly not explained, but that obviously is only motivated by Christianity because it is so very different from what's expected in the outside world. And the greater the challenge that's offered, the, the more the Christian motive is stressed. And this is particularly true in the final exchange. There are uh, three couplets here. There are uh, three different relationships. There's the husband and wife relationship. There's the father and child relationship, which obviously I think that would go for parent-child too. And then there is the the slave-master relationship because ancient households would have had uh, servants working in them. So those three couplets are, are put together um, and I think they're put together this way, where the thing that, well, you're, of course you're going to do that, is explained in terms of its, its Christian significance. The thing, what? Why would you do that? Is just told to the Christian, and it's assumed you're doing that because that's of Christ. And then each time, the, the more challenging there is, the more the motive is pointed out. So let's, all of that is prequel before we get into the, the household codes. The household codes are much shorter in Colossians than they are in Ephesians. Shouldn't take us very long to unpack them. Let's go ahead and get into that now. So we'll dive into the Christian household codes. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 are the first couplet we'll look at. And it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay. So I told you that in each case, you've got a thing that's kind of culturally expected and then a thing that's kind of culturally not expected. And the always the thing that, okay, the culture would not have had, would not have been shocked by comes first. So wives submit to your husbands in the ancient world. Um, that would have been like saying, water, make sure that you're wet. Um, the, or ice, be certain to be cold. Um, the in the ancient world the relationship between man and woman was for the most part i mean it's not universally true everywhere but for the most part um they did not live in an egalitarian world um the christian world was far more egalitarian than anywhere else in the ancient world um the idea of the concept of abuse is a modern one the idea of a man hitting a woman um, would not have been strange in the ancient world. Um, the idea of a woman standing up to her for her rights would have been bizarre in the ancient world. The idea that a woman had rights would have been strange. Um, in a lot of places, women couldn't testify in court because um, they weren't uh, cognitively able to really tell the difference between truth and fiction. Um, you know, they, they definitely were the weaker 
sex in terms of uh, of everything you know they were it was assumed that, that that was true cognitively and that was true morally and that was true emotionally and so a man's job was very much to control his wife and, and a wife's job was very much to be submissive that was just assumed in the ancient world but in the christian world submission doesn't is is a thing that that's really true of all christians towards others okay it's not as though there's ever a situation where a christian gets to oppress somebody else and gets to to use power over against others that's not supposed to happen and so we're all called to be submissive to everybody um, so this culturally expected role of a submissive wife in the ancient world is suddenly filled up with do that because it's fitting in the Lord. And so, you know, the, the wife is treated by Christianity as kind of a, an equal partner with her husband, someone who they, they work together as, um, as helpers suitable to one another. Um, to uh, raise the family, raise the children, forward the economic life of the home, forward the well-being of the home. And it's, it's not as though the husband is going to dominate the wife in the Christian family. But that doesn't mean that this now lib somewhat liberated woman should just, you know, suddenly begin to parade that sort of freedom in her family. And by her family, I mean the group of 70 persons. Imagine you're the only Christian uh, what we would think of as family, nuclear family, in that group of 70 people. And uh, if your relationship with your husband suddenly looks to the rest of the household as though it's, uh, it's gone south, you know, that you've, you've thrown off the shackles of his authority, you're going to cut down your family unit's influence on your greater family unit, on that group of 70 persons. So he's saying it's, it's fitting, you know, for Christians to be submissive anyway. And wives, submit to your husbands. Make sure that you keep that going on because that's going to be able to help you forward the mission of Christ in your home. But what is surprising, um, you know, and actually I don't think that's ever supposed to end precisely. Wives are supposed to treat their husbands with respect and honor and submission. And that's always supposed to go on. That becomes possible and beautiful when the husbands listen to Christ as well, because uh, Paul will tell the husbands, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, in the book of Ephesians, Paul will unpack much further um, why that should be the case. And he loads it up with a ton of, of Christian motives for loving your wife. What's important to realize is that in the in this, again, this sounds weird to us, but in the ancient world, it was very rare that a man married a woman for the sake of love um, or that a man was ever really expected to love his wife um, as in, you know, caring about her emotional well-being. That wasn't a real big husbandly duty that was expected. In fact, it might even be seen as weakness rather than virtue. It might be seen as vice by the Greco-Roman culture. You married a woman not because you loved her, but because she was from the same social strata as yourself. She had the right status. She came from an honorable family, and she was the person with whom you could produce honorable offspring. I mean, remember, you would have thought, her, thought of her very much as your lesser, not as your equal. You would have thought of her very much as, as beneath you. And the idea of loving something so pathetic and weak you know, to the Greco-Roman world, that would have been really weird. You know, you lo your love was reserved for other men. And I don't mean necessarily romantic love, although that probably would have been true too. But you would have had friendship and camaraderie and the closest relationships in your life wouldn't have been necessarily with your wife. Um, and uh, if you were a typical Roman, you may have even engaged in a good bit of romantic pederasty where you, you fell in love with a little boy and tried to seduce him. And he was the one you were really devoted to until he you know, grew up too much to be interesting. Um, that all flies in the face of creation, and it all flies in the face of the Christian commandment, which 
commands the, these people who have that kind of value system. Husbands, love your wives. So why is that? What would that do? Well, if you then live in a home where both of you basically are stepping down for the sake of the other to lift the other up, that's, that's what this couplet produces. The wife steps down to the will of her husband and the husband steps down to the well-being of the wife. The wife shows respect and honor to her husband and the husband shows that he treasures and honors his wife. And by the way, you treat a woman that way, you will fall in love with her. You know, you might, in our culture, people fall in love and marry because they're in love and then fall out of love because they're married and then maybe they don't like each other anymore. But if you treat a woman with honor and dignity, like you love her, you fall in love with her again because um, your feelings will follow your behavior. So he's going to tell her, don't be harsh. Now, imagine you have that kind of relationship where uh, the woman is not defiant. She is is willingly working cooperatively with her husband and the husband is not ignoring her needs but he is constantly caring for her and and tending to her now probably the people who would first notice that in the ancient family would be all the wives of the non-christians you know all the non-christian wives of the non-christians they'd be looking at your relationship going what's going on because they have the kind of the losing end of the pagan relationship setup. That'd be one reason. Plus, women tend to be more emotionally attuned, and so they'd be paying attention, and they'd see the beauty of your relationship, and they might point it out to their husbands. Um, but the men would then notice just how happy that man is. Um, because if you live this way, boy, you're both really happy. I mean, what is it that makes you happier than being in love? And so this commandment turns you into a kind of billboard for Christ that everybody who watches your family suddenly starts seeing, wow, there's really something beautiful going on there. And then as the commandments go on, they expand out from the kind of the foundation stone for the whole family is always a marriage. Um, family is always built around a marriage relationship. It's why what our culture has done with marriage is really so crazy to just totally redefine it. Well, you can't redefine marriage without redefining family. And it, it really is an assault on the one thing that we took with us from the Garden of Eden. The one, un, the one thing that predates the curse that we had is family. Um, and, but, that family then, that, that marriage then becomes the foundation stone for the lives of a lot of people, namely the children who are born out of that relationship. So the commandment next moves, and note again, children obey your parents. That's like saying, ice be cold, fire be hot. You don't have options about it. In the ancient culture, that's just a given. That's going to happen. So children obey your parents. Um, that's, of course they are, but no, the Christian reason is given. Children obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord. So the children that we're talking about here, we're not talking necessarily, it would include, it would be inclusive of those who are five and six years old, but uh, obviously they're less reasoning and less hearing. Here you're thinking more in terms of the the adult children living in that little that little room and their dad is the potter familius who lives in the larger room that's by the hallway that leads to the back quarters. Um, the potter familius is, is going to be the parent over everybody. And now the one place where this would not be true is with, where they command you not to be a Christian. You know, they, you disobey them then. But other than that, you obey that person. That is going to maintain that good relationship with the potter familius. And it's going to maintain a good relationship with with really the entire family but also the commandment obviously goes to young children you know obey your parents now imagine again you've got a household unit where it's a husband and wife and their kids they're in the little tiny household unit in that larger family structure and suddenly your the family becomes christian and all the other families are noticing that that their kids are being raised differently and are more obedient and more healthy than my kids. You know, my kids are running around everywhere. Why is it, you know, uh, Severus, that, that your kids behave so well? You know, well, you've become a Christian. There you go. It becomes a billboard 
for the, that group of 60 or 70 people. He also says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And again, that is not the ancient uh, pagan worldview of fathering necessarily. You know, an ancient pagan father was owed honor. And if he didn't get it, it was well within his rights to do just about whatever he wanted to to his children. But he's, he's commanding the Christian fathers you know, to be reasoning with their children, lest they become discouraged, I take to mean something along the lines of lest they give up the faith, be driven out of faith. Um, but again, so your your marriage relationship is one that, that testifies to the truth of Christianity, especially if both those people are doing the putting off of vice and putting on in virtue, so they're becoming people that are easier to love. They don't have the bad habits that make it hard to love them, and they have a lot of virtue that make them very lovable. So because they're in Christ and they're drawing on his power, they're becoming increasingly love, lovely people and lovable people. So their marriage is becoming stronger and more successful and more beautiful, and it becomes a testament to the rest of the family that isn't Christian that's looking at that family unit going, wow. And the same is true of the father and children relationship. The father has the responsibility of raising up the kids uh, in the ancient world. And how does he carry that responsibility out? He carries it out Christianly, you know, filled up with love and mercy. And the kids are going to live obediently. And you don't think that's an amazing thing in the ancient world. I mean, that would have been amazingly beautiful. Then the next couplet is separated by several verses because um, there's a lot that's given to bond servants. Um, but it's going to be the relationship between servant and master. So you have uh, bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Okay, so that really what you're doing is serving God by the way you carry out your faith. And then masters, which is really in chapter four, but belongs with this household code stuff. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And so in this case, the Christian, um, the Christian motive is expressed in the thing that wouldn't be expected of the worldly world. Uh, you know, the worldly expression of that relationship. In uh, Socrates, there's a, a dialogue in Socrates um, called the Euthyphro, and it's named after the guy that, that Socrates has the dialogue with. And Euthyphro is a guy who's doing something that is unbelievable in the ancient world. He is taking his father to court to prosecute him for the murder of a servant because the servant uh, got into a fight with one of Euthyphro's servants. It was two guys that worked for Euthyphro. Those two guys got in a fight, and one of them killed the other one. And so Euthyphro's father... Um, had the servant bound hand and foot and thrown into a ditch uh, to await news from an oracle so they could decide what to do with him. And then he forgot about him. He left him there, and the guy died of exposure and starvation. And Euthyphro is, is taking his dad to court. Um, that all would have been very shocking in the ancient world. For a guy to take his dad to court would have been shocking. For a guy to take his dad to court over a servant, that would have been the most shocking thing. The guy... The guy did what in the the ethics of the ancient world is entirely acceptable. A master basically owns a servant, and it was very rare. There were limits put on it. It's not like you could just be a sadist and expect the culture to ignore you. No, if you did that kind of thing, you risked the wrath of the gods coming against everybody else. So you couldn't do what was what was obviously evil, but within certain limits. Their lives were in your hands. You could bind them if they displeased you or if they did something that you thought was criminal. You could bind them hand and foot and throw them in a ditch and nobody would have thought a thing about it. Nobody would have helped that servant. You know, that would have been absolutely within the bounds. Now, if you did the same thing to a freed person or to a Roman citizen, you can expect to encounter a flog. You know, the magistrates are going to come for you because that's not just or fair. So in the minds of the Romans, you know, there is this concept of justice and fairness, but not for servants. And so when Paul instructs masters, masters treat your servants 
fairly and justly. He has just elevated servants, like massively elevated them in personhood and massively reduced the uh, freedom that a master would have in the ancient world. In a way, he has undercut the, the ethical foundations for slavery in the first place. And it's why Christianity, on the one hand, kind of put up with slavery for a long time, but it had sowed the seeds that would kill slavery in the long run. This kind of thing is what did that. Incidentally, and we'll look at this more closely next week, but uh, carrying this book to the Colossians is a guy named Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, and he's heading back to Philemon, and the entire book of Philemon is written about just this reality, that you should treat slaves as though they're people because they are. And when slaves convert to Christianity, particularly, you, you have to treat them as children of God because they are. What, this, what the masters are reminded of here is that, you know, you also have a master in heaven. So you are servant. How does he treat you? How does this master of yours in heaven, you're a slave of that one, and yet he treats you with honor and dignity and justice. So since that's true of you, you are then shown how to be master in this, in this relationship. This person who works for you and does work in your home, you have to treat them with justice and fairness. Now, that relationship alone, if you have a master who converts to Christianity, that would have been the most recognizable transformation that there was. Everyone who saw the way that person treated their servants would have known something up, was up with that guy because they would have been behaving in ways that were almost dishonorable in their culture. They would have, they would have been um, acting in ways that undermined the cultural expectations by loving their, their servants, by treating their servants with justice and fairness they would have been doing stuff that was really, really weird. But now let's look at what he has to say to bond servants because this is his most extensive exploration of Christian motives. I think because it's the most challenging of all the relationships. Um, because all the other relationships can point to some benefit that they get from being in that relationship. Um, even if they're on the supposedly losing side of things, a wife is definitely on the weaker end of the relationship in the pagan world. And when they become Christians, they're told to continue in something like that losing relationship. And you might say, well, I... but what do they get from that? Well, they're a member of a family. They are a mother in the family. Um, they get the love of their Christian spouse and the love of their kids, and they get to have kids. You know, they have a lot of honor that's tied up there. Even in their diminished honor society, there's a lot that they get from that. Um, husbands obviously get a lot out of the relationship with wife. Um, and in the ancient world especially, they get kids, they get offspring. That was a really big deal. Um, f children get a lot out of the relationship. They get a, a safe place to live and a place that gives them an identity. Especially, you know, children, you think, well, yeah, until they're 18 or so when they launch. No, remember, they don't launch. Okay, they continue to live at home. This is a group of like 80 people who all live at home. There is no launch. So you're always part of this group that's giving you this identity. And as part of this group, and when you're in your 30s, you know, you know who you are because you're part of this family. You know, that's the way in which the church most represents an ancient family. Um, you know who you are because you're part of this family. You're connected to this potter familius. You know, you have these elders who are representatives of Christ for you, who, who help you, give you wisdom in life, lead you to Jesus, you know, lead you to the Father. Um, I mean, so much of your identity is coming from that group. Well, in the ancient world, you knew who you were because you were part of this group of 60 or 70 or 100 people. Okay, so you get a lot of benefit from that. But the slave doesn't really get any benefit from his relationship. I suppose he gets food and maybe lodging in an outdoor, much lesser quarters. Okay, but, but so because of that, 
this person has the greatest challenge in behaving Christianly, especially if he is the only Christian in what the rest of the family is a non-Christian family. That is going to be a really tough relationship because they're not doing the set your mind on things above, get rid of vice, add virtue. So you're just dealing with humans, you know, fallen, broken humans who have all the wrath and anger. And very often they can't take it out on who they like to take it out on. So they take it out on you if you're a slave. Okay, so because of that, he gives a lot more guidance to them. So he'll say, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So he'll start by saying, you know, make sure you're actually serving them, you know, that you're, you're doing everything that you can to fulfill what their wants and needs are. You're giving actual service as a slave because you're doing this all for the Lord. And then he really goes on. He gives a lot more. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. Now, all of that, I think, is directed specifically at servants, although I suppose the general principle could be taken from here and given to all challenging relationships. And he's saying, work. remember that, that you're working to serve the Lord, and you're going to receive an inheritance. Now, for a servant, that's a really big word, because what do they inherit? Nothing. Servants don't inherit within the household that they serve. Now, if they serve well and for a certain number of years, they might be able to eventually buy their freedom. And buy, if they're in a, a Roman family, a family of Roman citizenship, they might, through that service, be, get to quite inherit their, uh, their citizenship along with their freedom. So they might become a house of freedmen. But um, that isn't the same as an inheritance. Um, what Jesus is offering is an inheritance in his household, which is, incidentally, the entire world. You know, that everything that exists is what we get to inherit. So he's saying, remember whose home you really belong to as you obey this earthly master. You're serving him, but you're really serving Jesus. Now, how on earth are you serving Jesus? Well, in part, you serve Jesus through every task that you do. But remember, Jesus wants to win over the people in that household for himself. He loves those people and he wants to give them, get them. So by your continuous act of goodness and kindness and mercy and love, your generous service to these people wins a hearing for the gospel through you. That, that eventually somebody in the household who has more influence than you do is going to notice the kind of person you are and say, how are you doing that? Okay, so that's how you are serving the Lord Christ. You're serving him both through what you do. Each act of, of physical labor becomes an act of service to the Lord. But also you serve him uh, by carrying out his mission because he wants those people. He would love to win everyone in the household that you're serving for Christ. And he'll say, for the wrongdoer will be paid back There is uh, for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality. And that's a way of, of the servant being able to deal with a really badly behaving non-Christian master, or even a really badly behaving Christian master, God forbid. I'm sure it happened a lot, where the Christian or the non-Christian loses their cool with the servant and beats them like crazy, binds them hand and foot and throws them in a well for a day, and then comes back and fishes them out. How do, how do I deal with it when I'm treated so unjustly? And he's saying, you know, just leave that to Jesus, because Jesus is really good at this, and it's not like he'll ever forget He'll deal with it in his time, and there's no partiality, meaning he's really good at this. He'll do what's right in the end. So you don't bear the grudge against the boss when the boss mistreats you. You just do what's good. Now, 
in every single case here, the Christian household code is encouraging behavior that will either take a cultural norm and intensify it and make it more beautiful, make it possible for you to do that cultural norm without resentment so that it's, it's beautiful and godly and gorgeous, or it's taking a cultural norm and standing it on its head in a way that is beautiful so that it's better than what the culture expects. And in every single case, people would have been looking at this and going, man, that's amazing. What he's calling for them to be is a leavening influence inside of their home so that what they become by their example is somebody who uh, the kingdom of heaven through them permeates the whole loaf of the family and gets all 60 or 70 people. So, uh, the mission then that you have is not merely to shape your own soul, although, of course, you have that mission. I mean, yes, you need to be shaping who you are as a person, because what do you have to give to God besides who you are as a person? Everything else that you have is his, that he's given to you. You could give it back to him, I suppose. But the one thing that you have that truly is your own to give to God is the kind of person you become. So yes, that's your mission. But also, through seeing your soul shaped by doing all that work together with Jesus, where you set your mind on things above, and then you put off and put to death vice, and you put on virtue, by doing that, you become a leavening influence on those around you. Now, here's the thing. Very often we say, you know, uh, you know the gospel that I preach, I do just by the way I live. I would say yes to that, and then I would say no. You know, there, there's a, I think it's Francis of Assisi who said, uh, preach everywhere you go, and if necessary, use words. Um, the reality is it eventually becomes necessary. You know, if, if you're actually going to persuade someone to believe the gospel, you're going to have to share with them why you do what you do. But what this, what I believe all this is doing here in the book of Colossians is it's saying by living this way, and by this way, I mean all of chapter three, and really everything that we've looked at so far in the book. I mean, trusting in this, this amazingly powerful person instead of your own wits and intellect and the things that you can learn, putting your trust in this, this amazing man who is God and setting your mind on things above and then putting to death what's evil and putting on what's good. By doing that, you earn the right then to be a servant of Christ in someone's else, someone else's life and share with them the good news about Jesus, about what Jesus has done for you. So all of these household codes become a way of living missionally. Now, of course, I think they are uh, a kind of, of return to what was creation expectation. That when God created humanity, we were created to live in families, and they were meant to look like this, where we submit to one another, love one another, where parents respect, uh, um, don't frustrate their kids, kids respect their parents. I mean, that love permeates everything, and honor lifts up everyone. I think that that's a return to actual beautiful family life. I suspect we will live that way forever. But it's very, I think, missional here. And I will suggest that if you live as Christian, you don't have a family unit to enter into, you know, or you've got these 70 other people who are all looking at you, that you and your little family family unit, the nuclear family unit you're part of, can influence the broader family that you live with. You don't have that. Um, I suppose if you live in a big city, maybe you have an apartment. Um, where most of us live, maybe you have a neighborhood. Um, although, for the most part, we don't know each other. You know, neighbors don't know each other. So, wherever your sphere of influence is, you live Christianly, and perhaps you will end up living missionally. All right, so next week we will look at uh, Paul's greetings and what they show us about the city of Colossae. And uh, we'll look a little bit at uh, specifically, uh, I've already mentioned Onesimus and, and what that tells us about one of the things this letter is meant to accomplish. Um, but for the most part, we have finished the, uh, the overall thrust and argument of this letter as of tonight. So we'll be wrapping up next week. Hope this is helpful to you. Uh, God bless. 
and uh, I hope we get together really soon. God bless you.